2021. My name is Dimas and I will be your host today for the keynote session. So today is the last day of DataCon LA. You might have seen how full the first couple of days were with informative, interesting, and insightful talks that inspire us to do great things with data. Well, today won't be anything less than that because we saved some of the best for last. But before we go into that, let me remind you that this year marks our ninth year data conference and the second virtual conference for us. DataCon LA has been growing from few thousand to few hundred to thousands of attendees and community members. This conference is brainchild for our, of our fearless leader, Subhash D'Souza. It's organized and supported by a community of volunteers and speakers. This event also wouldn't happen without uh, the support of our gold sponsors, Accenture, Bright Data, Disco, Cascada, MariaDB, and our silver sponsor, Del Bloomy, Oracle, MySQL, and Signify Technology. DataCon LA has become the largest data conference in Southern California, and it features the most vibrant gathering of data technology enthusiasts in Los Angeles, thanks to you guys. So to kick it off the third day of DataCon LA, we have a message from Eric Garcetti, the mayor of the city of LA and ambassador-elect to India. Eric Garcetti is a fourth generation Angelino and the 42nd mayor of Los Angeles, born and raised in San Fernando Valley, Mario Gassetti's life has been shaped by a deep commitment to the core value of justice, dignity, equality for all people. So here, I'm going to share with you his message. Hello, I'm Mayor Eric Garcetti, and it's my great honor to welcome you to DataCon 2021. Collecting, interpreting, and visualizing data allows us to understand the story of our collective lives. In the 15th century, Luca Pacioli used double entry bookkeeping to tell the fortunes of his city's merchant class. John Snow mapped cases of cholera in 1850s London and demonstrated how the water carried this disease. Today, big data helps health officials prevent new polio viruses from emerging and helps employers fight against hiring violence. In my eight plus years as mayor. Innovative applications of data science have helped Los Angeles keep our streets clean with our clean stat map. It's connected parents and students to an incredible number of opportunities through our learn, earn, and play app. Data tells us what we've done and expands our understanding of what we can do. Throughout this pandemic, quality data directed public health decisions about where to deploy vaccine and testing sites to find sickness sooner and spread wellness faster. It literally saved lives. So I hope that this gathering sparks new questions about what we can record and what it helps us to know. And I hope that you talk to someone who helps you see things in a new way and maybe even works with you on answering those new questions. Thank you for being part of DataCon. I can't wait to see what we will figure out together in the years ahead. All right, and so next up is Chris Fregley, a principal developer advocate for AI and machine learning at Amazon Web Services based in San Francisco, California. He is the co-author of O'Reilly's book, Data Science on AWS. Please welcome Chris. Well, hello everyone. Uh, let me share my screen real quick and we'll get this going. Oh, I think, is it already? Shared, I think it's already shared, right? Okay, let me get up to the top. Okay. Uh, can you all hear me okay and see my screen before I start? I think it looks good. Okay. So yes, today's talk is called 10 Things You Should Know About Quantum and Machine Learning. Now we only have 10 minutes, so this only gives me one minute per slide. Uh, so I'm gonna go through this particular talk pretty quickly. Just know that um, there are lots of uh, resources about quantum and quantum machine learning out there. Um, I'll point you to some. You could also check out our book that was released earlier this year that also covers quantum. Um, I'm a principal engineer at AWS, and I've been studying quantum for uh, pretty much the better part of the last 12 months. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting field. There's a lot going on. 
uh, it's still very, very early. And so because of that, there um, is going to be you know, quite a lot of, of places where I'll explain something and then say, oh, by the way, that's not quite ready yet. So um, also, if you want to reach me offline, there's my LinkedIn and there's a website to the book and to uh, the community that, that I've created around the book with workshops and YouTube videos and you know, lots and lots of other fun things. So let's get right into it. Here's some of, of the more popular quantum use cases. Now, keep in mind, these are largely theoretical. These are if we have enough qubits, and, and I haven't defined qubits yet, but I want to start off with the use case just to kind of get you excited and uh, see what's possible. Um, and so some of you may have read some of the, the fears about quantum that can actually break the uh, like modern RSA cryptography. And in theory, this is the case, right? Where we could actually break SSL. Um, we can break these, but uh, it, it does require about 6,000 clean qubits, which is about 1 million of our current day noisy qubits. And to keep this in perspective, today, our most powerful machines have around 100 qubits. Um, you know, maybe like getting up to like 200. So we are, are pretty far away from being able to break RSA. But because RSA really is built upon, you know, prime factorization, this is a very, very um, ripe use case for quantum. Um, and also some other use cases are simulations, like chemical simulations, protein folding. Uh, these are all very, very clean use cases uh, for quantum. Um, there's also other uses for quantum in the sort of larger space of just like optimizations, right? Finding mins, finding maxes, search and rank. And here's a relative set of the clean qubits that would be needed to do each of these things. Um, and so just a quick reminder that current hardware has about 100, maybe up to like 1000 qubits, uh, but these are the uh, like noisy qubits and therefore not the clean qubits that are uh, like really required. So um, the like this concept of noise will come up in in uh, like multiple places throughout this talk. So, and just note, you know, there's there's some estimates right now. It, one clean qubit would require about 150 noisy qubits to perform the uh, like error correction. Um, okay, so. Uh, so quantum, um, yeah. So uh, like quantum computing is based on quantum mechanics, and quantum mechanics is really nature's operating system, which is kind of fun uh, to think about. So uh, the other thing to know too about quantum computing is there's so many fields involved, so many disciplines. And if you think back to some of the hardest classes that you took in college or you know high school or or postgraduate, you know this is quantum physics, this is electrical engineering, chemical engineering, material science, thermodynamics, fluid dynamics, photonics, and of course our familiar linear algebra and probabilistic methods. The probabilistic techniques, those are some of the the really really fundamental from uh, the like mathematical side. Um, we'll talk about that, that more here in a bit uh, when we cover some of the fundamentals of quantum, of, uh, like quantum computing, such as superposition. Just uh, um, as a fun side note, yeah, Einstein actually called quantum uh, mechanics spooky. That was his term, uh, specifically spooky. He said that there's no reasonable definition of reality that could expect to permit quantum mechanics. So um, yeah, Einstein didn't understand this, could not uh, reason through it. And um, today we are um, starting to like prove him wrong. There's still quite a lot of internal debate. So this is something else that you'll realize about quantum computing right now. There's still fundamental uh, theoretical things that, that, that we, we still can't uh, like understand, for example, when a qubit collapses out of superposition what's happening there. And so if you don't understand superposition or qubit, that's my next slide here. Quantum fundamentals. So think of a qubit, uh, it, it could be similar to a uh, like classic qubit where it is it, it, it will ultimately represent a zero or a one, but it's first put into a state that's called superposition where it could be 50% zero or 50% one, 
that's the, the whole probabilistic um, uh, like part of this. And so this relates to, in fact, if I back up real quick, this very first slide. When we were first taught about electrons, we always showed, we're showing that like electrons follow this nice clean path around the nucleus, right? And that's not the case. It's actually a cloud of probability where these electrons can be. It's not running on those smooth like ellipticals as are shown here. These can be anywhere, right? And so that cloud of probability is what's called superposition. And so not until you actually measure each qubit will uh, that qubit actually fall out of superposition and turn into a zero or a one. Okay, so, but while that, that data is in the superposition, there is massive amount of, of like computational power uh, that you can um, uh, build and build upon, much more than a classic digital zero or one. Okay, so uh, like I said, measurement, when you, you actually go to measure, that causes that qubit to collapse. Now, some people think there's actually two different um, you know, worlds being created. There's like a lot of, you know, theoretical, there's like parallel universes being created. And then when you collapse, it, it, it just chooses one of those parallel universes. Lots and lots of like theoretical debate within the uh, community. So, and then the other one that uh, like really bugged Einstein is this concept of entanglement. And this is, this is that spookiness where two qubits can always collapse to the same state. 100% of the time, even if they're thousands of miles away. Okay, so uh, it's a, a very spooky fundamental aspect of quantum mechanics, but it has been proven to happen. And so um, the superposition, the measurement, the entanglement, and the fourth one here is then interference. These are really the, the four fundamental principles behind quantum mechanics. Um, for the interference, think of it as waves. You can positively or constructively interfere where you're sort of amplifying the wave. A and then you can also destructively and, and sort of minimize the wave. Um, and so this is you know, wave theory. And, and this is the fact that we're actually passing through um, uh, what's called microwaves, right? Like physically microwaves through these systems. And we are altering the, the probabilistic balance of these qubits. And it's sort of nudging them into closer to zero or closer to one. So maybe 80% zero and you know 20% one by sending in these waves. And so as we're developing these like quantum algorithms through you know quantum circuits, we are actually nudging those probabilities. And, and I'll talk about that more here in a bit. There's uh, one other principle I will uh, reference later. It's called the no cloning principle. This means you, you cannot create a new qubit out of um, a current qubit. And so this is a little bit confusing because I just said that with the entanglement principle, I can entangle the states of two qubits. But those were two separate qubits to begin with. The uh, like no cloning, which we'll talk about in a bit, uh, means I can't actually copy and paste, for example, um, a new qubit from an existing one. And so often you'll you'll hear about you know teleportation in, in the uh, quantum mechanics. That's not actually teleporting and creating new matter. That's actually just passing in data or you know using the entanglement for two qubits that already exist, and then just making sure that when they collapse, they both collapse to the same value. Um, so I think I'm going to skip through some of this here, but um, I had already mentioned that, that these circuits, these, these algorithms, quantum algorithms, are designed to nudge those superposition probabilities so that when, when we do go to measure, they will highlight you know, certain uh, things that are similar, you know, for example, um, and the or will then minimize things that are are not in, um, that that should not show up in the measurement. Okay, um, there's some some of the common gates that you'll hear is the Hadamard gate. This is what actually puts data into superposition within a set of of qubits, either one qubit or multiple qubits. The other one is um, that's pretty popular is the controlled knot. 
that's actually what will cause entanglement between two qubits. That's a two qubit operator. It's a two qubit gate. Those words are used synonymously. If you want to look at uh, the other gates, there's actually not that many. There's about 10 here. Uh, but the ones you will almost always see are the Hadamard, because that's really where we get things into superposition and then can perform the massive, par the uh, like massively parallel computations. Uh, Grover's algorithm very very fundamental for uh, many optimization problems. Builds on this concept of like the interference uh, and then uh, like amplifying the like correct answer and then deamplifying the wrong answer. Shor's algorithm, this is potentially the scary one that could break RSA if uh, given enough qubits. Um, and, then qual um, and then quantum walk, this is walking graphs, finding you know, minimum path, things like that. Let me check uh, how much time I have here, a couple minutes, okay. Um, so this is the other, it, uh, so this sets the context. This is where we are today. So we call this the quantum eras, and there's something called quantum uh, supremacy and then quantum uh, advantage. And these, right now, we're in the, the second era here, which is, uh, which is called NISC, Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. That's this, this big blob, uh, this black blob here in this diagram. So we just reached over supremacy. And with supremacy, we were able to do something that a classical computer could not do. Now, with supremacy, it, it was actually a fairly simple problem. This was made famous back in uh, 2019 uh, by Google. However, it was a, a very, very simple problem. Um, I believe it was just random sampling, but showing that we could random sample much, uh, you know, on a uh, like much larger data set, um, much quicker than a classical uh, like computer could do. Once we hit the advantage. That's where we actually have useful apps. Um, we we are seeing you know at least linear speedups and like hopefully exponential speedups over um, the classic supercomputers. And so today's qubits are are between about fifty and one hundred thousand. Still haven't seen any one hundred thousand, but that's in theory what will be today's moderately useful apps. And when we get into the one hundred thousand plus, so that's where we will really see. Uh, the uh, uh, like best use of quantum. Um, the the early days we were less than fifty uh, qubits, and and those were just toy sample apps. Okay, let me move a little quicker here. Um, yeah, so massive parallelism. Uh, those are the highlights. We can get exponential speedups in theory. Some of the lowlights. Current qubits do not hold state very long. This is on the order of like of uh, like nanoseconds and like milliseconds. This prevents us from from creating long circuits or long you know long like algorithms. We have to keep our our circuit depth very short. Current hardware is noisy, still very sensitive to the physical environment to its uh, surroundings. Right, like temperature uh, has to be below zero, um, and uh, also, yes, like I, I, I had said before, one clean qubit does require about 150 noisy qubits to perform error correction. Uh, very, very active area of research. This gets us into quantum data, QRAM, quantum RAM, and then, of course, error correction. Uh, just to, to quickly summarize here, this is going to be the biggest barrier for us to actually develop useful apps. We need quantum RAM that can take data, put it into superposition, and hold it for longer periods of time. We need L1 caches, L2 caches. We need all of those for quantum, which is just not possible today. Um, I was just on a call yesterday where the current estimate is about 15 to 20 years. So no matter what we do on the computation side, we still need to solve the quantum RAM side. Um, right now, what we're doing is we are constantly putting things into superposition over and over again. Every time I go to actually execute my circuit, I have to start from scratch, take my classical data, which is zeros and ones, put it into superposition. And that actually takes quite a lot of time. Then I have to measure it, which then pulls it out of superposition, puts it into classic, and then store it onto, uh, into like you know disk or like regular RAM. Um, we do have simulators, by the way, that can you know help us get through some of these like early phases just to learn the APIs. 
Um, and, but, you know, for a 30 qubit um, simulator, we need 16 gigs of RAM for 40 qubits. We need 16 terabytes for 50 qubits. We need 16 petabytes. Uh, and so this is quite a lot of RAM, not really found um, too easily, not unless you're on like a super large cloud instance or you start doing distributed uh, memory sharing. Um, okay, I'll get through this one really quickly. Hardware, there's really three main types. There's superconducting, which is mostly what you'll hear about. Um, that's the ones from Google, from, uh, from like IBM. There's trapped ion. There's this company IonQ that in photonics, there's a, a company called Xanadu, X-A-N-A-D-U, uh, that has been doing quite a lot and using um, things like lasers uh, and you know, shooting photons. And um, that would be the alternative to sending in microwaves to, to like modify those probabilities. If you're doing photonic-based quantum, you would be sending in photons and using lasers. And um, OK, and then there's different methods. Uh, so far, we've pretty much only covered gate-based. There is something called annealing. Um, and you would choose different hardware and like different methods based on what type of problem. If you're doing optimization problems, oftentimes you want to go to the annealing hardware. Um, what's cool about the Amazon Bracket service, and, and I'm trying not to make this a plug, I do work for, for Amazon for uh, like AWS, so I have access to, to the to these services, but I can actually run my code on these, these three different hardware types and see which one works best for my use case. Uh, and that's with just one line of code, I could switch uh, the hardware backend. So this just gives you a quick view of what this looks like. You can choose from these. Um, in case you're interested in like the SDKs and simulators, so Open Chasm is basically the Java bytecode, if you will, of um, the uh, like quantum world. And then on top of Open Chasm, um, yes, IBM has built their SDK. Um, and Google Circ actually does not build on Open Chasm. Uh, they have the, their own SDK that's specific to their uh, like Google hardware. Um, but for uh, like the most part, you want to stick with uh, what's being built upon Open Chasm? That way, you could try out different uh, like hardware. Uh, TensorFlow does have something that they just released called uh, TensorFlow Quantum, and this really is for you to to mix and match between TensorFlow, Keras, and Circ. And so, you know, Circ again is their SDK for their uh, Google specific quantum hardware. Bracket SDK, um, we just announced, I believe it was on Thursday or Friday, uh, where we are now partnering with the Open Chasm. And so Bracket, if it hasn't already, will be supporting Open Chasm, so that uh, like Java bytecode, if you will. Uh, the cool thing about the Amazon Bracket SDK is that, so once again, you could try different hardware with just one line of code. You also integrate with S3 for your data, IM for your security, and CloudWatch for your uh, logs and metrics. Um, Penny Lane is something to look into as well, open source uh, bracket and the like AWS folks. We have partnered with uh, the company behind Penny Lane, which is also Xanadu, the folks doing the photonic based quantum hardware. Um, and the cool thing is that these simulators let you actually try out quantum uh, like algorithms and, and circuits and not have to pay for the quantum hardware. And these simulators can actually simulate the current uh, like noisy environment that the physical hardware gives us. This then you know, helps us actually um, build these circuits in a realistic world. Uh, OK, uh, last slide. So quantum machine learning, still very, very early field. I'll just answer the uh, number one question that comes up, which is, when should I use quantum for my machine learning? When should I use classical? The answer right now is just keep using classical. Quantum is still very, very early. We have theoretical speed ups. Uh, the, the closest that we've come is hybrid classic and quantum. And if you see in like the upper right there, you can actually treat quantum, these uh, like these QPUs, quant these like quantum processor units, similar to how we would treat like GPUs, where we, we would do most of our control logic in the CPU. 
We would then pass the sort of batch processing into the GPU for the massive parallelism that it is capable of doing, and then collect that data and then optimize and you know send in new weights, update the weights, and then um, so yeah, very similar to GPU. So pretty much all of the useful quantum machine learning algorithms today um, are a mix of classic and quantum hybrid. Um, but you can certainly find examples of quantum PCA, quantum support vector machines, quantum clustering, uh, quantum linear regression, binary classification, and quantum neural networks. And I think that's it. Uh, we don't have time for the demo, but um, I'll post these slides. And uh, yeah, I want to point out this, this cool quantum flywheel. So this is, I had got this from a slide from one of my uh, peers. And you know, really, right now we're not ready to deploy quantum at scale, but now's the best time to really get familiar with these APIs, start to get your like intuition about the hardware, get your intuition about the uh, different capabilities, and you know some of these like limitations, um, and really understand quantum so that when we do hit uh, full scale, you'll be ready to go. So thank you very much. Yeah, check me out on LinkedIn or Twitter, and check out the book. Thank you, Chris, for letting us speak into the future of computing with quantum mechanics fundamentals. Super interesting. We actually have Dr. Mark Jackson on quantum computing uh, later today to learn more. Anyhow, um, our next keynote speaker is Harrison Tang, AKA the Harrison, Harrison, the CEO dad. He is the chief executive officer and the co-founder of Spokio. He started Spokio with his college roommate, uh, Mike Daly, CTO, and the, Eric Liang is now the CIO in 2006 in his parents' basement. Uh, Harrison guides Spokio's product vision to build an experienced team that helps the company realize its mission of making the world around us more transparent. Under his leadership, Harrison has helped build scale Spokio's user base from zero to serving tens of millions of users. He is passionate about building products that help customers get their jobs done. Harrison earned his BAS degree in electrical engineering and economics and MS degree in electrical engineering at Stanford University. Please give your warm welcome to Harrison. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I'm Harrison Tain, and today uh, I would like to share with you about my thoughts in regards to the future of data and privacy in 10 minutes. So a quick note about myself. I'm Harrison Tain, the CEO of Dad, pretty self-experimentary. I'm the CEO of Spokio and Dad of Three Sons. We are a people intelligence service. If you haven't heard of Spokio, we are a people intelligence service that helps over 50 million users a month to search, connect, and know who, who you're dealing with. Uh, since 2006, uh, 2006, we aggregate over 12 billion records into 600 million profiles so that people can make more informed people-based decisions. Our mission is to make the world around us more transparent. And we are the only B2C data company that builds data experiences on top of our own data technology. Now, I would like to start off with sharing some of the trends I've seen in the past decade. First of all, we're seeing more people data. The data revolution has already happened. It has empowered multiple use cases across whether it's uh, marketing technologies, social networks, recommendation engines, or even self-driving cars. In our industry, we're seeing growth in both B2C and B2B identity use cases. In the B2C world, we see growth in people search, we see growth in genealogy identity theft protections. In the, B in the B2B world, we see growth in identity, identity and access management, whether it's the workforce IAM or customer IAM, or identity uh, verifications, authentications, and so on, so on, so on. We see more needs in regards to having more integrated view into who the person is, whether in the B2C or B2B context. At the same time, we also see uh, more talks in regards to the privacy, right? We see more regulations such as CCPA, CPRA, GDPR, and those are not going away. In fact, those are, we will see more and more of that. 
And that's why we also see more money and more investments into identity, privacy, and consent management. Pri privacy paradox do exist. By the way, privacy paradox is a phenomenon in which most people say they care about privacy, but they don't do anything about it. Okay. Such paradox does exist today, but I do believe that it will change later as the category confusion around what data and privacy means clears up for regular folks. Most people think data and privacy goes against each other, but today I'm gonna to show you how they can co coexist on top of personalized transparency and control. So since Spokio is a data company, we like to be exact about the definitions. When people say, hey, they care about privacy, identity, I ask them, the first question I ask them is, what is identity? What is privacy? And unfortunately, most people stumble. So let's start with defining what is identity first. In philosophy, identity is defined as accessible characteristic or attributes that defines a distinct entity. So based on this definition, there's three aspects to identity. The first aspect is obviously data attributes. This includes name, contact information, behavioral data, credit, finance, financial information, personality, and so on, so on, so on. This information can come from the user themselves, which is first party, their friends and families, or independent third party. So for example, if I'm an Uber driver, the, my Uber rating from Uber is part of my identity. The second aspect is this concept of entity. It sounds very simple because uh, entity or a person in this case, in the physical world is just, is just what you see. But in the digital world, it's actually very, very qu quite complicated. Because how do you know a record belongs to a person? And how do you know a record that changes over time still belongs to the same person? In philosophy, there's a thought experiment called ship of Theseus, which is talking about how the constituents of a ship, if it all gets replaced over time, is this still the same ship? So this is the question that we're trying to solve with entity resolution. Lastly, the third aspect is access control. Data that cannot be accessed are just zeros and ones on some database, some random database that no one cares about. So how do you ensure the right person, the right people have the right access to the right data? You know, that is a key aspect of identity as well. Now that we have defined what identity is, let's define what privacy means. So in social psychology, privacy is defined as a selective control of access to the self or to one's group. There's two levels of privacy, desire and actual. If your actual privacy is higher than the desired privacy, you'll feel lonely, you'll feel isolated. On the opposite end, you'll feel exposed. So the privacy regulations goal is to achieve the optimal level of privacy matching desire and actual levels of the privacy. Privacy is unique to each social interaction. Different people feel differently about privacy. And guess what? Even for the same person, how I feel about privacy today can change over time. It's temporal, it's dynamic. I personally feel comfortable sharing social security numbers with my wife, with my, uh, with my mom, right? But some random guy on the street, I'm not so sure about. I'm personally sh comfortable sharing phone numbers with some random guy on the street, but I'm not sure about you. Some people might feel differently. So at the end of the day, privacy is inherently social because inherently it's about data access. So it's unique to each and different social interactions. And that's why the solution to data privacy is personalization. Just like how personalization have revolutionized marketing, almost I will use the word almost, almost real, realizing the dream of one-to-one -one marketing. Personalization can revolutionize data privacy and achieving this idea of one-to-one -one privacy. If we could build a recommendation engine that recommends what I want to watch right, on video platforms to a 70, 80% accuracy, 
I bet you we can build a recommendation recommendation engine that recommends what data you would like to share in different contexts, different circumstances at different times. So I'm just proposing a couple of ways how we can build this. But at the end of the day, you know, this can be done because at, at the end of the day, the technology is there, right? The features and dimensions, the six W's in English, right? who, what, how, where, when, whom, right? Why, those can all be defined. So personalization is definitely the solution and definitely something that we can do to, to bring data and privacy, help them coexist together. And the truth is personalization and is just one aspect of the future of identity. There's other aspects to the future as well. I believe the future of identity will include self-sovereignty. You control your own identity, not companies or com co companies or governments, not Spokio. The identity infrastructure is not gonna be owned by a few companies or governments. It's gonna be decentralized. At the same time, the identity can still be easily federated so that it can be easily processed and available to use for good. It's gonna be personalized, it's gonna be secure, and it's gonna be intelligent. Identity today is the mean to the end, the how to the what. But I do believe that at some point your digital identity can make basic decisions and interactions on your behalf so that it also becomes the question of what. We are at the uh, inflection point of the impending identity revolution. More and more online act activities are moving online and your digital identity is going to be become more and more important. There are many, many different market opportunities, whether in the B2C context, people search identity protection and management, genealogy, or, or in the B2B context, right? consent and privacy management, IAM in both workforce IAM, customer IAM, identity verification, and so on and so on. There are many, many different business opportunities out there. And there are many, many different ways that we can redefine what digital identity means for people. We are building an identity platform. So if you're interested to join such revolution, check out spokio.com slash careers. And don't forget to follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. I've talked about different ways, you know, the six dimensions to what the future identity will be. I don't have time to cover all of them, but I will actually share it on my social media at a later time. So just follow me on, my handle is uh, the CEO dad, pretty, pretty easy to remember. So talk to you then, thanks. All right. Thank you, Harrison, for showing us that it is possible that data and privacy can go hand in hand and at scale. Thank you for that. So our next speaker is Eric Weber. He is currently the head of experimentation, economic insights, and metrics at Yelp. He also advises and teaches at Product Faculty and Propulsion Academy. After teaching for years in academia, he has worked in senior leadership and individual contributor roles at Yelp, LinkedIn, and CoreLogic. He loves working with data, educating others and about data's value and helping uh, people excel in technical roles. It's a pleasure having you here, Eric. The stage is yours. Great, thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here today. And rather than dive into slides, I want to kind of start with a story. Uh, every company that I've ever joined, about a month in, I learn enough to find out that all of these data assets, all of these models, all of these dashboards that people have built essentially aren't doing the work that they intended to do when they first started. Um, I think I sometimes refer it to as the model and grave <laughs> model and uh, dashboard graveyard. And we have data science teams, AI teams, engineers building so many things. And I bet that if you take a moment, you can think about something that you've built that seems so important in the moment but ultimately people didn't end up using it 
they used it for a couple of weeks or it didn't and didn't continue to be used. This is really why I'm talking about data and thinking about data as a product. I've started talking about this a lot over the last six to seven months. And the reason that I'm talking about it today is whether you ever become a data product manager or not, thinking like a product manager when you build data assets and create them is ultimately going to become more and more important. And I'm going to give you three things to think about today. So I'm not going to do this in a slide. I'm going to try to make it very simplistic. The three things I want you to think about that are going to enable you to think about the things you build like a product are to think about your customer, to think about your company, and also to think about your competitors and other options. So again, customer, company, competitors, and other options. The first one I'll start with is thinking about your customer. So it's really, really interesting, compelling to learn all of these techniques that we can use to build different models, to build different dashboards. And at so many companies, we see data science teams chasing the interesting, the compelling, the bright, the shiny, ultimately creating data assets that are too short lived. And this is not the fault of people doing the wrong thing. In the moment, it feels like the right thing to build, right? This seems like, oh, well, people have been talking about this. We should create it. We should build it in a sustainable way. But what happens is you don't think enough about exactly who your downstream customer is. Your customer may be the person pinging you in Slack. It may be the person asking you by email for something. It may be the person in the meeting saying, I need this thing now. But that doesn't always represent what your customer actually needs. And this is really where it becomes really important as a data professional to be able to think about who your customer is overall, not just who they are in that Slack message or in that email. And this requires thinking about what they're trying to do. Um, when it comes to creating long-lived data assets that are going to provide value for a company, you have to think about what the person or group of people is actually trying to accomplish. For example, you could take a sales organization that in the moment is saying, we need to drive conversion rate up. Are they trying to drive conversion rate up because conversion rate is the most important thing? Or are they trying to drive conversion rate up because they're trying to create an overall book of sales? They're trying to create a more compelling view of who their customers are. Ultimately, your job as a data professional is to understand what they're trying to do overall, not what they're trying to do in that specific moment. So this is very much thinking like kind of a product manager, which is not only taking your customer as what they say in the moment, but more ultimately trying to build a picture of what they're trying to do overall. So that's the first point. Focus on what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish. Ultimately, any successful data product that you build is going to be about creating value for people, not necessarily pushing metrics up, not necessarily um, driving adoption, but understanding how to actually create value, whether the customer is internal or external. The second point is talking about your company overall. A second reason that a lot of data products fail, whether it be a model, a dashboard, whatever it is, is that you're not thinking about what your company is trying to do overall. So let's say that you have two options. You could spend your time building this dashboard for this uh, marketing leader, or you could spend your time building this uh, feature mart that is going to be a long lived data asset that's gonna allow you to train and ship models. The marketing leader might say, this is the most important thing in the world. There may not be anybody telling you that that feature mart is the thing that your company ultimately needs. But when you're working as a data professional, something that you really have to focus on is, how do I create this long lived data asset that is truly an asset to my company? And this is where it goes beyond thinking about your individual customer and thinking about what your company is trying to do. How do you think about what your company is trying to do? This is where thinking about mission and vision, what is your C-level board trying to drive at your company? What are they trying to improve over the next one to two years? What is the overall company's product roadmap? 
Because if you are building data assets that enable the company to actually make progress on its overall roadmap, its overall vision, the real focus here is creating data assets that plug into that overall vision, not necessarily li listening to what that marketing leader has to say on that particular day. Because speaking from experience, people's opinions and perspectives really change depending on the day-to-day -day and on what's hot for discussion in the business. So when you're thinking about data as a product, like I've mentioned, you've thought about your customer, not just what they say, but who they are, what they're trying to actually accomplish. You've thought about your company. What is your company's vision and mission? What are they ultimately trying to do and change in the marketplace? The third point is to think about competitors or options. So this is where I see people spend not enough time in that we think very simplistically about what our potential options are. Sometimes, I'm sure some of you are familiar, you walk in and you say, okay, I need a dashboard with all the bells and whistles on it. Everything here has to be perfect. It has to be fancy. Um, it has to work perfectly. The underlying data has to be great. Another option is you could create sort of an MVP where it does some basic functions, but it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. So it's not necessarily thinking about your competitors when you're talking about an internal product, but you're talking about what your options are. Maybe option A, where you're talking about the dashboard that doesn't have all the bells and whistles, is superior to option B, ultimately because it does the job, right? You may not need all of the fancy things that are available. The second part of this conversation, when you shift from talking about internal customers to external, is thinking about what is going to provide value for those external customers. Again, back to this point, if you think about what's available, and this comes in with like a build versus buy conversation, so many companies are focused on building their own version of something. My question is, why? If you're going to build your own version of something, you should have a compelling reason to do it. You should think about that thing that you're building as an actual differentiator for your business and for yourself. If it doesn't provide a differentiation as a business or for yourself, then potentially you think about using competitive options that are out in the marketplace. You can potentially buy things instead of build them internally. So the focus here well, ultimately, when I talk about thinking about data as a product, the idea is that the vast majority of people are not going to end up being data product managers over time. But what's really going to move the industry forward is people thinking like product managers and adopting behaviors that focus on that. And so when you walk away from thinking about this short discussion, if you think more about who your customer is internally, what your company is, and what they're trying to do, and also your competitors and alternative options, those three things give you an opportunity to really create value downstream, to create value as a data professional. And ultimately, I can promise you that it creates more career opportunities and better internal mobility for yourself. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, and I look forward to the rest of the talks. Uh, thank you, Eric, for reminding us that being in the data world, we need to keep in mind the three C's, customer, company, and competitors, and other options. Um, it, was a, it was a great concept there to be reminded of. So our next guest is Jyothi Pradhan. She is the Chief Executive Officer at Curlon Enterprise Limited. After completing her BE in Electronics and Communication from Manipal Institute of Technology, Jyothi got her MS in Engineering Management from the University of Southern California, Los Angeles. In the last 15 years, Jyothi worked in the multinational companies um, in engineering, marketing, and leadership roles, but realized that her true affinity was being an entrepreneur. So then Jyothi got her MBA in Innovation and Entrepreneurship from the University of California, Irvine, and has returned to India in 2019 to join her family business, Jyothi, 
the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Timas. Uh, good morning, good evening, and uh, I'm very happy to be here, part of Datacon LA. Let me quickly share my screen here. It's definitely data is something that everybody goes after. But how does it help all of us? I think that is the real question. And as long as data is just information, it's uh, halfway there. The real, real value comes in when that information can be used for decisions, either to proceed with something or not to proceed with something. And with that, I would like to present to you a short little case study of how we're how Curlon has been using data. What was the transformation we went through in the uh, in the recent past, and how everything has come together more out of uh, reason or requirement than much of a choice. I'm just trying to find my file here. Let me try to see if I can pull up my, my PowerPoint. I think every presentation I'm in, you learn something new about technology that you haven't heard or learned before. Let's see if I can try sharing it. Okay, let me try my entire screen. Maybe that'll work. I hope you are able to see it. Okay. So, Curlon. Curlon is a company that was started in 1962. It was started by my grandfather as Con Karnataka Consumer Products Limited with the intent of creating social entrepreneurship, of creating local jobs for the la ladies in their uh, local localities. Coming from Coyer, a part of the coconut that is not really used in the food chain, but to convert it into a product that can add value. Over the last six de decades, uh, Curlon has become synonymous with mattress. In India, if you say mattress, people say Curlon. If you say Curlon, people say mattress. We have today 10 world-class factories a retail reach of over 10,000 counters. And we've always been first to market with innovation. And not to forget that we have, in the last 15 years, consecutively won the Super Brand India Award, an award that, is, that very few brands win and shows the commitment of the consumer and the trust they place in the brand. And what started out with mattresses today has evolved into sleep solutions, home solutions, and industry solutions. For those of you who haven't been in India, been to India, India is a country with 1.3 billion uh, people. That to people in the tech world translates to 1.3 million data points, right? So with these many people, Having a livelihood is of utmost priority to everybody. And innovation becomes a means of survival, not an option. As you can see here in the picture, this is a fruit stand. It is four poles with a tarp on top, where the local guy serves a fresh cut fruit to travelers on a lonely road. When I used to visit India between 2005 and 2015. Nothing much had changed. But since 2015, when people started having access to mobile phones, which were affordable, when people started wanting to have uh, smartphones, the entire landscape changed. And with every visit, I saw exponential growth by more than a decade with every year I was visiting uh, back home to visit family. A simple fruit stand like this, today because of technology, 
has been able to map himself on Google Maps. Not only that, he even has pictures and reviews of what he's selling. And all of this is possible because of the location mapping, because of the reviews, and more importantly today, because of contactless payment. Everybody has learned to use digital money in India, something nobody would have even had a phantom of, probably if you'd asked them maybe five to six years ago. India used to be a mostly cash rich economy and you know, cash transactions were the name of the game. But today contactless payments, digital payments, all made possible due to uh, having a smartphone has completely changed the landscape. Let me now talk a little bit about the mattress industry. India is a place where you have mattresses for every customer from $8 per mattress to $8,000 per mattress, the equivalent. You will find a product as per your taste. But the local guy who used to make the $8 mattress only had one option, to make it and showcase it at the street corner, like, uh, like shown in the picture. And the only traffic he would get is a traffic on that street. Today, through easy access of the device he holds in his hand, he now has access to the marketplace on Amazon. So not only that, you will see that he's now got access to customers all over the country. Something nobody could even phantom, right? And look at the search word. It says Gadda. Gadda is uh, the Hindi name for a mattress. And he's got reviews. And hey, if you cannot even afford the 700 rupees, which is about $10, He's even got options of financing. Look there, it says no cost EMI, right? The world has changed. India has changed. And that is where the opportunity lies. The pandemic, which uh, you know, shook up the entire world, really shook up a country like India, because we went into one of the strictest lockdowns in the entire world. For two whole months, we could, could not even step out of our homes. Everything that was uh, possible was only uh, possible through digitalization, through digital uh, interactions. Curlon as a company for, that was born in the 20th century, we had whatever worked for us for the last you know, five, six decades. But in the pandemic, it brought out a lot of gaps that we needed I had no other choice, but we had to fill up to become a 21st century organization. A transformation started right from our vendors. We had to relook at our supply chain. Previously, all we would worry about is the quality of the material coming in. But with the pandemic, we had to get into the details of which country is it coming from? Is it going to have to go into the, the ports? Will it have enough time? This was data we did not have. And we needed to have it in order to be able to service the 100,000 mattresses we make every month. Material tracking. India was also going through a, a situation where they were trying to build quarantine centers and we had to send mattresses for these quarantine centers. And in spite of the lockdown, we were allowed to operate our factories at, with the minimal uh, set of staff. But the material had to pass through three states to get to the quarantine centers. And each state had its own set of uh, rules on how we should be giving the paperwork. So all of a sudden, we needed to have a, a central repository where we could give all the documents so that the, the shipment could go and reach on time. Integration of systems was the need of the hour. Also, the, rem the working in the organization, remote collaboration. We were used to having face-to-face -face business. This was new for us and our team members. We had to quickly get onto a collaborative platform where we could work together as a team uh, in spite of all the, the noises from the kitchen and everything else going on at home. Also data for contact tracing. 
our factories and our warehouses, 10 factories and over 72 warehouses, became potential um, points of concern. That is where the trucks uh, interchanged there to, to drop off material and pick up stuff. What if somebody was uh, asymptomatic and COVID positive? Would we have to shut down the entire place? How would we keep our staff and our people safe? We needed data for contract tracing. This further showed us that we needed to upgrade our systems. Also, our retail partners. People who were used to you know, going seven days a week, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., going to their shops, were all of a sudden just stuck at home. They didn't know what to do. So we began to virtually engage them. And technology played such a critical role in, uh, in, our, um, uh, in the way that we could engage with them and we could uh, discuss with them different things we could do together. Contactless ordering forced us to create an app that is today running in the organization very successfully. And it also forced us to, to go to digital payments. And this is how we were forced to go from a digitization to digitalization. In Curlon 2.0, so much had changed during the pandemic that we realized we weren't the old company that we were uh, before. Today, as we look at the digital evolution for the value chain, we have an AR technology that is driving our comfort zone app. It lets you experience products in the comfort of your home. And you can even decorate with multiple products, creating an entire experience in your home before you even walk out of the house. Real-time access to data has given control in the hands of our partners. They have access to data analytics. They can see what products are selling better, how much more, uh, how much credit they have on their account. They even have access to seeing real-time stock status. And during the pandemic, the second wave that hit us, we were able to ride the wave or rather surf the wave with the fact that we were connected digitally. Today, we are also enabling an AI chatbot through the WhatsApp platform. So our partners are just one click away from the answers that they need. As we look into the future, I'd like to share a quote from our founder, late Mr. T. Ramesh Upai. He believed that there were two ways to make money in life. One is the way everyone thinks. How can I become a billionaire? Another way is to ask, how can I make a difference? And that's the path we have chosen. We are looking at resource management. By 2025, India will have 1.6 billion people, accounting to almost 20% of the world's population. The space or the country is not growing. We have to be careful with our resources. So a lot of focus is being given on EPR, which is Extended Producer Responsibility and the Circular Journey. All the sustainability, carbon footprint mapping is happening in the organization. And the transparency of how we are working using blockchain technology. I would now like to show you our newest addition to our product portfolio, Origins, Planet Friendly Furniture. Let me quickly go back here and share with you a short video clip. My, there we go. Do I need to share any sound or? You're sharing the wrong screen. Can you please share the right screen? Can you see it now? Can you see it now?
And that, ladies and gentlemen, is brings us to the end of this presentation. Thank you so much. Subhash, can you help me and share the screen? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. You're you're good now, Jyoti. So um let's see here. Yeah, so thank you, Jyoti, for showing us how data can bridge the gap with various challenges in communication, supply chain, and access in places like India. Our last speaker is the co-founder and chief data scientist at Satari, a cutting edge streaming video and TV ad tech platform. Mike Swinson has applied data science over the years in a wide range of disciplines from engineering to fraud detection and has worked as the lead quant at a boutique hedge fund as well as serving as a chief data scientist at TrueCar, leading both the R&D and marketing analytics efforts to help take that company public in 2014. He has been issued more than 50 US patents in the computational algorithm design. Welcome, Mike, the stage is yours. All right, thank you <clears throat> and good morning. You know, as I was prepping these remarks, I remember one of the first DataCon LA conferences that I attended a while ago. The inspiration of listening to the speakers at that and similar conferences helped inspire me to start my own company, applying data science to accurately measure and optimize performance from TV and streaming video ads. What really inspires me about data science is the ability to extract useful insights from information. In fact, I focus my career on doing just that, whether that be finding innovative ways to incorporate new data sources that might not have been used before for that particular application, or even using the same data <coughs> as others, but paying careful attention to biases that might be lurking under the surface of existing solutions and finding ways of generating even greater results, uh, greater accuracy in the results. So I firmly believe that the key to most effectively using data for good is to first use data well. So for this talk, I wanna discuss some of the common pitfalls in modeling that I've seen over the years and how you might attempt to avoid them. Now, from the outside looking in, it might seem as if data science is all about applying the fanciest deep learning algorithms to our problems and that we spend all of our time building models. Well, <clears throat> in reality, of course, much of our time is spent data wrangling and cleansing the data as we carefully curate the sample to remove inherent biases. In fact, the fundamental trade-off that we must contend with is that of bias and noise. Now, these biases might be something simple, like excluding time ranges when a client site is down, but it's extremely important that the population we sample from matches the population that we apply our results to. Otherwise, no matter how elegant our model, our results won't be applicable. So assuming we've taken care of the more obvious inherent biases, there's still a lot of work to be done to help ensure that whatever algorithm we use will work as well as possible. That even holds true for self-learning algorithms. So <clears throat> let's talk about <clears throat> algorithms for a moment. Now, one of the things that you won't see in my professional bio is that I'm, a, I'm an avid board game enthusiast. So specifically Euro games, which is a, a class of strategic board games. So I've been able to compete in tournaments internationally over the past couple of years and have been fortunate enough to place in the top three at the world championships for several uh, of the tournaments that I participate in. Now, one of the trends in board games is the advent of more advanced artificial intelligence agents from algorithms like Deep Blue uh, to AlphaGo that specialize in specific games to more recently Mu Zero, which is a more flexible algorithm that's applicable to a wide range of games. Now, Mu0 is a self-learning algorithm that constructs its own dynamic model of the environment and then uses reinforcement learning to optimize. So it's basically using a, a Monte Carlo tree search to select its moves. It does this by representing the search space as a series of neural networks, each designed to isolate something specific. So one to an, um, understand the value of the current game state, a second to decipher how best to evolve, and a third to map the game state into initial representation. Then it optimizes these networks simultaneously. But I mention this because one of the advantages we have in using deep learning algorithms like Mu0 in this application is that their training data is easily constructed. You can generate as much data as you need for the model to optimize its decisions. 
So with potentially unlimited data, you have certain options available to you. But in other fields, this data constraint is very real. And it can be expensive to generate new data. Even in the realm of big data, we still might run into issues of data sparsity that can occur in ways that might be surprising to some people. Now, data sparsity can occur as we increase the number of variables or dimensions that we include in the model. In fact, we can show mathematically that the majority of the data volume will concentrate in an outer shell with increasing dimensionality. So as the number of features grows, the quantity of data needed to general, you know, generalize accurately uh, will grow exponentially as well. So in fact, as we try to force in too many variables, uh, we often find that it's difficult for automated algorithms to hone in on an optimal solution that might involve many layers or interactions between these attributes. So while none of us would intentionally build a model that overfits, it is a hidden danger in any algorithm as we construct you know, and increase the number of dimensions we attempt to fit. Um, this is the classic overfitting problem and it is a direct consequence of data sparsity and the curse of dimensionality. Now, one common algorithm that we use in marketing analytics is the MTA or multi-touch attribution model. The goal of the algorithm is to isolate the contribution of each marketing channel to a response. So let's take a, you know, a, a sale, for example. So the company can identify how best to optimize or spend, yet these algorithms can suffer from bias as they require a full accounting of touch points for each user. So for offline channels like TV or radio or billboards, this might be impossible to identify. But there's another issue. If we target populations to advertise based on those that have higher innate response and then fit a model to isolate contribution, then we'll identify key differences in response by group, but those differences will not separate between the population and the treatment effect. What we're really after is understanding the marginal effect of the treatment alone. And yet if we're not careful, we bias our results by polluting them with differences due to population. Now, one approach to handle this is to try to structure the data to ensure that we can isolate the information necessary for our model. Now, this can be done through appropriate testing. A well-designed experiment can help us ensure that our model has appropriate control groups for each treatment combination. But as the number of different treatments grows, the complexity of the test design can increase exponentially as well. And we might still run into some of the same problems. So another approach that we can try to account for um, this is kind of using, this, using a, an algorithm design. And so here we can leverage traditional dimension reduction techniques, principal component analysis, LDA, projection pursuits, uh, any of the manifold learning techniques like MDS or ISOMAP. These automated dimension reduction approaches are key tools in our toolbox as they can help us combat overfitting. Yet another approach that we can use in conjunction with these is feature engineering. Now, algorithms might be superior at sifting through the muddled webs of data, trying to extract intrinsic correlations um, you know, for example, finding that uh, 3 a.m. time slot for ads might not work well generally, but for mattress ads, it's actually a high response time slot. Or that people who like to watch horror films are actually a good audience to target for meditation apps. Um, but these algorithms often require huge quantities of data to extract truly complex relationships, especially if that information is not organized appropriately. So one advantage that we have as humans over an algorithm is that humans are very good at narrowing down the search space using our cognitive abilities, our own biological neural network, if you will, to do some of the pruning first. Then we can construct new features that isolate causal relationships to help the algorithms converge more quickly. This becomes extremely important when data generation is expensive, either in time or money. For instance, if you're working with IP or location data, perhaps one key feature is distance. So immediately translate that data to distances. If you're working with prices, is price the only thing that's important here? Or is it also important to know the relative price, perhaps price discounts or percent savings? When I was working in the credit card space, we try to predict the likelihood of default. Understanding if and how much someone paid each month was important, but it was also extremely important to understand why. Why is this person not making a full payment? Is it because they forgot to pay? Or is it that they're living at the edge of their means, paying as much as they can? Knowing that someone didn't pay, or paid less than the full amount was important, but knowing that they called into our VRU or accessed the app first to find out how much they owed and yet still didn't pay the full amount, well, that was even more important. Now, this type of feature engineering requires us to try to understand the reasons or causative factors that lead to a predictable response. 
Encoding attributes that capture these causal relationships is especially important when we can't auto-generate as much data as we'd like. Now at Tatari, as I'm sure you have at your workplace, we have a collection of tools that we can use depending on the specific problem we're trying to solve. But what I wanna leave you with is that one thing we all must do with each of our models is to think first about the problem we're trying to solve, the dimensionality that our data can support, any inherent biases in the data that we must account for, and the limitations of the algorithms we're attempting to utilize. Then we can employ some of the solutions that I've discussed here to try to address these biases. And only then can we craft the solution that's most suitable for the problem at hand. Thank you very much. I hope this is beneficial. I just wanna say that I truly appreciate the time that you've taken out of your busy schedules to listen to our big data and data science talks. It really reflects on your internal drive to keep on top of discussions in the field. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, for sharing with us um, a little bit about the algorithm and you know the, the things that we need to consider when um, creating or designing a, a, an algorithm. You know, thinking about the problems and the biases first before you know executing a, a model. And actually, thank you for the rest of the keynote speakers here for sharing their vision and expertise and for building a community around data that allows innovation and inspiration to create. Thank you again to our gold sponsors this year, Accenture, Bright Data, Disco, Cascada, and Marriott DB, our silver sponsors, Dell Boomi, Oracle, MySQL, and Signify Technology. You can actually check out some of the sponsors tracks today. To everyone here today, we have another day full of great content and sessions, panels, and tutorials. If you missed some of the earlier talks, you can find them in Hopin during the conference on the left panel under replay. But once the conference is over, we'll let you know by email once they are available on YouTube for your viewing. So thank you again for being here and enjoy the last day of DataCon LA 2021.